a summons. The long carpet before her was deep purple. It seemed to go on for miles, the truth not being too far from her estimation. To her side were huge colonnades, sumptuous expansive windows of every shade and hue, depictions of ancient history, victories, honors, and horrors, the very history of this world. In her wake, but comfortably distant, were those who would be seen after her. Before her was the one procession of priests of the ecclesiarchy coming back from their audience. She stowed the carpet alone, head held high, pace wide and expansive. The guards watched her as she glided up the stairs to the chamber, her poise a thing of wonder, her bald head giving her an allure that was rare in these days. For in a world of similarity and conformity, she seemed the only one willing to be able to truly shine. The two guards at the door bowed as she approached the apex, and they then opened the double doors into a staggering sight, a throne room of opulence and power. Of course, no less than the regent deserved, for this world, this absconditae tenebrae, was rich and important, and the line of regents had been long and near uninterrupted since the days of blood. Alone, the regent sat at his massive marble desk, only finishing and putting his quill aside as she was a mere two paces from the desk, in the exact position of the supplicant, the questioned. The hawk-nosed regent looked up and snapped, At last! You, madam, are late! No, I am precisely on time. You have only just finished your notes. Hence, I did not disturb you. The regent frowned at the flagrant breach of protocol, then sneered as he said, Never talk back to me. Your arrival at court has brought strange changes, the fad of hairless pates being the least of it all. Change brings growth, my lord. Not all change is good. But some is beneficial. One might even say necessary for the continuation of the populace. You do not speak to what is or is not good for the populace I rule. Yet I am a member of your court. Would you rather I were an advisor or a sycophant? The older man rumbled, more in shock than anger. Know your place! A telling response, she said with a wry smile. You test my patience, madam. She now curtsied for the first time, but held the smile on her lips as she bobbed never breaking eye contact. Which is not my aim, your highness. Let us be frank, regent. The hives are in turmoil, the arbites overrun, the docks barely functioning. You require support. I require compliance. That hasn't gone so well, has it? The regent then stood and drew himself up to his full height, towering over the young lady. I grow tired of your truculence. Then let me soothe away your concerns. And with that, her eyes glowed, and the regent stared back blankly at her, while his very consciousness was being redrawn, his personality recreated block by block. At its end, the regent snapped back into the present and then beamed at the bald, aristocratic woman in front of him. As you say, I could do with the assistance. You take control of the civic situation. You have my full confidence and the backing of my regency bull. Go. Bring order back to my realm. As she held out her hand, 
the regent walked around the huge desk and passed her what she had been waiting for. She, the Magus, then turned and swept from the room with his ring of office. She walked the carpet out of the audience halls, going to rule in his stead. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and units of the Warhammer 40k universe, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And today, we shall take a simple and brief look at one of the most insidious and relevant threats to the Imperium, a Xenos-infected Psyker who holds an iron grip on their entire organization, a being who answers to one thing and one thing only, the patriarch of their cult. Of course, I can only be speaking of the gene stealer cult Magus. Terrifyingly powerful and a very real threat to the Imperium, which I will discuss later, it is high time we got to know these horrors better. And so, as usual, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote, a Magus, also called a Gene Stealer Magus, is a Gene Stealer hybrid who has developed the ability of a Psyker. A Magus serves as their cult's primary enforcer, propagandist, and diplomat to those outside of the cult. They possess psychic abilities second in potency only to those of their cult's Gene Stealer patriarch. Maguses are psychically gifted and possessed of a supernatural charisma. Their control of the gene stealer hybrids and brood brothers around them is total. As a prophet of their gene stealer patriarch, the word of Omegus is law for those of their cult and their telepathic abilities are more than powerful enough to enforce it. Yet for all their commanding presence, intelligence and mental skill, each Magus is no more than an extension of the Patriarch's will through the cult's brood mind, just as a Patriarch is an embodiment of the wider Tyranid hive mind. A given cult gene sect's Magus is its foremost link to the Imperial aristocracy, government and institutions of a world. Should the dynasty find its expansion stymied by a planetary governor or other strong-minded rival, a Magus, may well visit the obstinate individual in person, using honeyed words and their psychic powers to either force their obedience or convert them to a cause. In moments, the deed is done, and the cult has a highly placed agent instead of a difficult adversary. The web of influence woven by Amagus ensnares all levels of imperial society, from the upper echelons of the spire-born classes to street level Adipsus Arbites enforcers and even the ranks of the Astra Militarum. Omegus is born of at least one warp-touched parent who is already a psyker. Should an infested world harbor psychically gifted individuals of the right mental caliber, the cult's pure strain gene stealers will sniff them out and psychically hypnotize them, then infect them with the gene stealer kiss. Soon enough, one of these hosts will father or give birth to a Magus. Tall, clean of limb, and with an imposing presence, a Magus can pass for a normal human and commands respect wherever they walk. In their soul, however, they are as much a creature of the void as a member of mankind. They hold the same otherworldly power in their eyes as a patriarch they call Lord and Saviour and are bound by the same unearthly drive to spread the cult far and wide. It is the Magus who speaks for their hidden organization in matters both mystical and spiritual, and in many ways they are the true mastermind behind the spread of the cult across its host planet and beyond. Burgeoning Gene Stealer cults will usually have only one of these psychers at their heart, the guiding hand of the uprising. As the insurrection swells and spreads across the surface of a planet, 
New sites ripe for infection are located, and new gene sects of the cult founded. As these brood cycles grow anew, other maguses are born who oversee these distant regions and the cells that operate within them. These powerful bioforms often fancy themselves rivals of their peers on the same world, believing that their gene sire favors only one of their number as his high prophet. They seek to outdo one another with ambitious acts of infamy and subversion. This is but an elaborate overture, of course, for their differences and festering grudges are immediately put aside when the cult's uprising begins. Any illusion of autonomy fades away, and the Maguses work in perfect concert to achieve their patriarch's desires and unknowingly pave the way for the coming of the Tyranids. When the hour of ascension arrives, Amagus will lead the faithful of their gene sect to battle, unleashing the full terrible might of their psychic powers. Where once their hypnotizing gaze was employed to dominate obstinate rivals and ultimately sway them to the cult's cause, now it is used to pit their enemies against one another. Unable to resist the spell-binding influence of the Magus, Blank-eyed Imperial soldiers turn their guns upon their comrades, slaughtering them with robotic indifference. Entire squads of enemy warriors are left stumbling and dazed by waves of disorientating psychic energy, unable to react as the cult's biomorph-equipped shock troops barrel into their ranks. End quote. Now the threat of the Magus and the Gene Stealer cult's entire are not to be underestimated. Like a chaos cult, but with so many fewer actual ways to detect them, they pose a very real and present danger to the empire of mankind. Because they do what few others can. They mobilize the human race against its own best interests. They literally roll into a human community or any other really, then slowly subvert them, sapping their strength, their loyalty, and, eventually, all ability to even wish to resist the high fleets of the Great Devourer. It has been many a world that has ostensibly appeared solid, a bastille of human strength that has simply crumbled when a tyrannid tendril has approached, all due to the dark influence of the gene stealer cults. Now, chaos cults are as dangerous, but are actually more easily discovered. Magic items, wards, psychers, a canny inquisitor, or even arbiter. All ways to detect the infection of the great powers of the dark gods. And the chaos cults have difficulty containing their zeal for their gods. Their need to express their new devotion in acts of degenerate horror that are inevitably going to become so excessive that it is impossible to hold the secret forever. But not so, the genes still are cults. They are patient. They are disciplined. They are also far more effective at what they do. And as stated, so much harder to discern because of this. The one example that proves this more than any amount of confabulation from myself is simple indeed. For recently, there was a gene stealer cult on Holy Terror itself, a threat that the Adeptus Custodes, the 10,000 strong bodyguard of the Emperor, faced head on. Yet, they gained a foothold. Perhaps their influence endures, despite the efforts of the Custodes. It would be almost impossible to tell. For in the grim darkness of the far future, the people of the Imperium are packed in so thick, the individual so insignificant, entire regions being almost lawless, in the hives, in the many primitive worlds of the Imperium, that the usual social controls of being witnessed, recognized, and thus constrained by social pressure, are all but negated. Oh, millions, billions, and even trillions are forced to mouth the litanies of praise to the Emperor, but with this level of population, it is impossible to see into the hearts of others, to be sure that people will notice the individual now acting erratically or counter to their previous wishes and professed modus operandi. 
and it is in these shadows that the Xenos filth lurk. Watching and waiting and slowly building their power until they are ready to strike. Hence it is the gene stealer cults that pose one of the most important and existential threats to the continuation of the human hegemony. For when the high fleets of the Tyranids arrive in strength, push forever into the interior of the Imperium, there is one terrible fact that can never be factored in in all of the logistic chains. And it is this. Which worlds will actually hold and which worlds will immediately fold? A sobering thought indeed. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. I hope you've enjoyed this brief introduction. Now, we do have a second channel, GK Natural History, and affiliate links. So when you buy figures through them, then I gain the funds to buy some myself. So go have a look in the description, and follow the links if you wish. Thank you for your precious time. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.